All right, welcome everyone to another afternoon with Joe Slazik. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Emily and I am the teen librarian at Appleton Public Library. I'm here joined with Kathleen. You wanna say hello, Kathleen? Hi. Hi everyone, and I'm here with Joe. Just a few um, housekeeping things. Um, so I do have on the, on the chat box um, a survey um, at the conclusion of the session, uh, the session, the session, if you can please uh, fill out, um, it's called the project outcome uh, survey. If you can please fill it out, that would help us with future programming. If you enjoyed it today, if you learned anything exciting, uh, if you took anything away from today's presentation, we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out. It's very brief, only a couple of questions. So thank you so much for um, your participation today, for being here. Today is the second to last presentation of Joe's um, NASA session. Our last one uh, for the spring will be on May 25th at 1 p.m. We're hoping to bring this back maybe in fall. We're not sure in what format, maybe in person, maybe virtual. Um, well, We'll let you know. Um, so yeah, keep up with us on social media through our calendar for more information. And yeah, we'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you, Joe. Hi, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. This session is about seeing the night sky. Everybody wonders what's in the night sky. I'll, I'll need to have, you always think you gotta be in a spaceship to go into space, but we're going to show you you can see the night sky without any spaceship required. And later on, I'll talk about telescopes. But that's our subject for today, uh, what's out there. And uh, once again, I'm coming to you on behalf of the Solar System Ambassadors Group, sponsored by NASA. Uh, and that means that I'm a volunteer. It means that I conduct these presentations free for any organization. I attend special training programs. And I'm also in contact with the experts who have made some of these programs and who have the information about that. Uh, in this case, we'll be uh, presenting this uh, pretty much uh, one person. We had a couple of shared people last time, but uh, we'll do this this way. So this session is about the stars. And what are you going to gain? Um, we're going to find out where and when you can find objects at night, what kind of space treasures and space junks, man-made objects are out there. Um, what you can find in the sky, constellations, planets, etc. cetera. Uh, daytime viewing. You might think that the sky is only good to view at night, but there's surprisingly a lot of things you can find during this day. And I'm gonna talk about telescopes and binoculars in, in specific, uh, not any particular models or anything, but just generally how they work. And uh, major sky events that are coming up this month that you can watch for. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, connect with me. I just gotta get something here. All right. So we'll proceed. Okay. That was not what I wanted to do. Let me just reset this again. Share screen, PowerPoint, share. Okay, Just, uh, I have a remote control and all the time I keep hitting the other button. Okay, night sky, so what's up there? Sit on a fence, you look out your backyard, you're on a hill or something, you look up there and you wonder, so what's the use? I, I, I can't see anything in particular, but there are a lot of things out there. All of these things are out there. We got moon, planets, individual stars, star clusters, which we call the Messier objects, constellations, nebulae, uh, asteroids, comets, and man-made satellites, as well as what I call space junk out there. And there's a lot of it out there. But we're gonna talk about most of these things just to make you aware of what's there. It's not gonna be a whole astronomy lecture, but just to get you alerted 
to the resources you have to watch the sky, how you can watch the sky, what you can do to locate things. So again, there's natural light out there in the sky that you wouldn't believe should be there. If you're, if you're in a dark sky area, and unfortunately being in Appleton, it's, there's a lot of light out here. Yes, you can see certain things, but it's best that you have the darkest sky you can find. I have a place out in Matoma. I go there and I set up my telescopes and I can watch out there. Uh, unfortunately, people in the uh, city don't shield their lights from the side. They let the light go blindingly out all over the place, yet there are devices that would shield the uh, skylight, uh, the light coming from this, and you'd be able to see the skies better. You can see auroras out there, probably not here. I have seen them in Watoma on a real dark sky night. And when I know that there's an event which causes the aurora in the north to kind of sink southernly. I've seen colors in the sky. I've seen the shimmering, dancing auroras up in Watoma. So it's possible, but it's rare. And finally, um, from the sun, when there's a coronal mass, mass ejection, this causes an aurora because it collides with the Earth and the Earth's magnetic shield causes it to glow. So that's why you might see certain auroras uh, because the coronal mass emissions, ejections, uh, cause an event that have the aurora grow or glow more brightly as they sink southern. Of course, we all know about the, the biggest thing in the sky, which is the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. This is something that everyone should kind of learn about because they are essential to navigation, to finding other stars. And if you look up at the night sky in Appleton, you should be able to see it. And here's how to find the North Star, which by the way, never moves. It is a point in which all the other stars rotate around. You've probably seen some of these photographs where you see Polaris in the center and streaks of light going all around it. Well, that's because Polaris is the central point of, uh, of our particular galaxy. Now to find it, you go down to the Little Dipper, which is lower to the horizon, and you line up the two, scar, uh, the two stars that are there, Marak and Dobni, which are on the outer end of the Small Dipper. And then you go back up to Polaris. See how they, the ends of them form the Polaris. Actually, so they, they're the Big Dipper. Polaris is a Small Dipper. So at the arm of Polaris at the end, you can see the arrow pointing to Polaris. That's the way you find these two. And you'd be surprised you could find them in the night sky quite easily. You just need a little bit of imagination. Uh, that's the one thing I have found that sometimes I look up and I say, I can't see anything, I can't see anything. Well, you kind of have to calm down. I don't know what you do to meditate or whatever, but you kind of have to get used to the sky get used to what's up there and you'll see these things. You have to have imagination. You'll see bright stars like Sirius. And why? Because they're really giant stars way far off, but they do tend to dominate the sky. And I'll tell you where to find those later. They're part of constellations. And Deneb, which is a super giant star that shines brightly out there. And uh, it, it's also uh, a a good star to align uh, your ability to find these different constellations. So you got this night sky and you look out there, all these objects are out there. I gotta say though, there are daytime star uh, viewing too, and that involves the sun, moon, um, some stars like Venus in the morning and in the late evening. And uh, otherwise you don't really see any other stars, but because it comes out, early in the morning and is there late in the evening, we, uh, we call it a daytime viewing star. So how do you cut through all this stuff? Well, uh, Joe, there's a question in the chat quick about, the, about yeah. Polaris, the North Star. Yeah, uh, Mike, Mike asks, does the North Star always show true north or does it vary a bit? Actually, it's a good question. The North Star tro shows true north, but your compass is, is uh, set up to show magnetic north. So if you're gonna navigate through true north, use the north star. If you're gonna navigate through a compass, well, that's okay, 
but keep in mind where the North Star is. The compass is pointing towards magnetic north, and that shifts over centuries. It can shift. The magnetic north can shift a bit, but the North Star is really up there, and it's constant, and it's very accurate, and that's the one I would use if I got lost, because you, you know that it's uh, pretty much there. So during the daytime, you can see the sun, and through a telescope, you can see sunspots, and I think it's really neat to see sunspots. You can also see the eclipse of the sun. And the last few years, there was one, and I drove to St. Louis or South to view it. And what I have here is a disc that goes over the front part of that telescope. And when you use this disc, you can see the eclipse. So I was, I, I put a towel with duct tape on this. Look at that. And I put this over my head and I began to just look at the sun through this sun filter disc. I was lucky I had one of these. Acetylene glasses will do the same thing or welding glasses, I would say. But this one, I haven't taken the duct tape off yet. Not that there's an upcoming eclipse, but I thought it was kind of neat. Maybe I might be able to use this to view the sun during the day, which uh, if you can, you'll see, you won't see sunspots. But there is a device called a hydrogen alpha filter, which fits in this eyepiece section here on the telescope. You see that, Emily? Am I showing that correctly? Yes. Okay. So when you look at the end of this telescope, you can see this eyepiece. And this is, this is called a uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope. I'll show you how that works later. But a hydrogen alpha filter, it's really neat because it really shows the sun in a different wavelength. And that's why that lower right-hand picture shows up that way. Um, so you can see the, uh, the waves, the uh, magnetic flame waves that are there. You can see certain stars. As I said, you could see um, Venus. And I didn't put this in here, but you could see some of those Starlink satellites if they're bright enough that Elon Musk has been uh, launching. And he's launched hundreds already and plans to offer hundreds more in space. And there's a lot of stuff up there with these satellites. If you want to find anything, one of the best places to go is a website called heavensabove.com. And uh, when you type that in, you will be able to put in your local coordinates, your longitude, your latitude, ask for your address. And in all of the uh, subcategories, see all these categories here? There's more. I only took a picture of part of the page. There's more here that allows you to uh, locate all these different objects that are up there. Now they, uh, they do have predictions for the ISS, et cetera. So this is a, a, one of the pages that I go to that I really like. This has a lot of information on it. Uh, and you could print out a chart of when the International Space Station is flying overhead. We'll use this later on. Now, the other way to find out what's up in the sky is learn how to use something called the planisphere. And I have one right here. It looks like the one on the right. There's smaller ones in different styles. There's hundreds of planispheres that come along here. So this one here is the big giant yellow one. Why? Because I need it, because I need to see it. Uh, if I use one of those small ones, I can't see it. But you're able to turn the inner ring, as you can see on the yellow ring, is turning on the inner side. And what comes in view is you set the day and the time. So if I'm in April on this side here, and today is the 27th, and I want to view something at 1 a.m., so I go and I turn it to April 27th, 1 a.m. Probably could see that, I hope, maybe not. 1 a.m., it's right there, 1 a.m. And all of the stars that are here will appear in the sky. The key thing is you have to face south and you have to hold the chart up like that. So if I'm, fa I'm actually facing north, my orientation here in my office, I'd be facing south. And 
I can see the constellations where they are on the chart. I can look up and I can compare it to the sky. And this, this planisphere system works really great. Uh, this is the basics for viewing the sky. Now, if you you get to be a pro and you can memorize all this stuff and know where they are, that's fine. In fact, the uh, there's two places that you should go. One is the Barlow Planetarium. I think that's open right now. It's part of UW Wisconsin. Sit in the Barlow Planetarium for a session at night. They'll show you all of the constellations in that huge dome that they have. And the local astronomy club is called New Star Northeast. Northeast Stargazers. And New Star has meetings at the Barlow Planetarium. Join them and a lot of people will uh, tell you about the stars, how to find them. In addition, New Star in June of this year, I think it's the first uh, weekend. In fact, I think it's earlier than June. I have to look up the date. They have a star party where the members of the club go out to Hartman Creek Park in Wapaka. They set up all their telescopes and you could come around as part of the public and you can join in one evening and, and see what they're seeing, use their telescopes, find out what you can see through a telescope. So that's really a very good activity to attend, a star party put on by the local astronomy club called New Star, or go to a planetarium and go through a series of viewings. They'll demonstrate to you what's in the sky, how to find it. Recently, though, there's been another way to find uh, things in the sky. I don't have one of these, but it's one of these telephone apps. And you can download these apps on your phone. And as you take your phone and put it up to the sky, it imp imprints in your screen what the constellations are, where the stars are, where are the stars. So if I find a bright star and I point at it, this phone app will tell me what that star is. I find that to be valuable when I'm trying to set up my telescope and orient it. Because this telescope in the back, one of the unique things about it, and I have a bigger one. This, is, this happens to be an eight inch Ultima uh, Celestron. It has a computer that once you line up two stars, that scope will slew anywhere in the sky to find out other stars. It has a whole program it can run through and give you an evening tour of what's up in the sky through that telescope. Um, the, the, those are sold in many different sizes. I have a 12 inch one in Watoma and that's about as big as I can go. A 12 inch one weighs about 75 pounds and fits on a tripod, a huge tripod. So it's kind of hard to set up, but at any rate, it does help to have the sky app on the phone to tell you what stars you want to line up. Or a lot of times I've had to use this planisphere to tell me where that is. So you have two instruments here, potentially that tell you where the stars are. Okay. Now, one thing about stars is that there's something called the magnitude. And magnitude is a measure of brightness. So when you hear something as a negative magnitude, that means that it gets bright. When you get to zero, which happens to be Betelgeuse, the star out there, and I'll show you where that is. Then you get descriptions of magnitude as plus two, uh, plus one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is about the max you might be able to see. Those get fainter. So in comparison, when you look at this chart here, you can see the Sun, Moon, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, all with their relative brightness or magnitude. It's called apparent magnitude. Now, when you get into some technical discussions, visual magnitude measurements will differ. But from the charts that I have, these are the magnitudes of the, uh, the major planets. Notice I, I've put five and nine, because there's three things in the center in between Mars and Saturn that are slightly brighter than Saturn. But we'll look at those. So the next one, Mercury, Venus, and some stars. Now we get into Canopus. We get into uh, um, Rigel Cantaris, which is actually Alpha Centauri. Arcturus, Vega, one of the brighter star stars in the sky. Usually you will see that to the Northeast. 
and Betelgeuse, which I explained was at zero. So you can see how the brightnesses of things differ. Another comparison on this chart shows you where these objects are on the brightness scale. So one is the brightness, six is the weakest. Any positive number gets weaker, any negative number gets brighter. Now, who thought of that or what astronomers decide that they were gonna do it that way or what system was in effect? I don't have any idea how that came about. I've been trying to find that out, but I haven't. Uh, it's kind of reverse thinking. So what do we have in terms of uh, common objects to view? Well, it, uh, match them up. You got the moon, you got Jupiter, you got Saturn, um, and you've got the uh, different constellations such as Mizar, and that's in the Big Dipper, Albero, Orion Nebula is like a, a cloud. You can see that cloud. You just have to have a good telescope to see it. And uh, a few others. Can you see these by naked eye? Well, uh, not exactly. Uh, you if you don't have a telescope, you could get an astronomer's set of binoculars with a 50 degree uh, lens. Now these are small. These are actually land binoculars. But the bigger these lenses are, the more light they let in. And I've had, I've got one on Watoma that's about 50 millimeter lens or larger. And I can pull in some of these objects very faintly, but they come in view and you can look at them. So if you have a pair of binoculars for viewing the moon, this is gonna be great. When you see evidence of planets out there, when they're out and you take a look at the star charts and they say the planets are out, these will help you pick up faint detail of those uh, planets. Now, number three down there, I have seen Saturn like that in, in binoculars that I have in Watoma. Uh, you, you, don't, you can see Saturn a little clearly with a 10 inch scope or some of those scopes. Uh, by the way, I also seen it in this small scope. This small scope is a 90 millimeter Maksutov telescope. I can pack this up in a case and I've taken it with me into trips. And what happens is I can also swoop. This is not computerized, but it has a little reflective patch in the front and you have your eyepiece viewing in the back here. I happen to put a plug in it right here so I can keep it clean. So I look down like this and I'll show you how that works later. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, um, can you tell everyone where they can um, get one of the, um, I don't remember what they were called, but the star map things, where can people get those? Um, sure. And the second one. question, the second question after you answer that one is um, in number six, is that I don't know, it says Orion Nebula. Is that the same thing as the Milky Way or? No, okay. um, Milky Way, if I'll get to that. This Orion Nebula, it, it, it's a very faint cloud. You don't see color in most telescopes, but it's in the uh, Orion, the Hunter constellation. I'll show you where that is. And that seven is a globular cluster. You can very well see that and tell us in these uh, binoculars. But the uh, Orion Nebula is very faint. You, you really have to stare at it a while. You have to have good seeing conditions. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting into telescope, but um, actually uh, you, in a clear night on really dark skies, you could see some of these things with, without the aid of a telescope by use of binoculars. So they're up there. These things are up there and it only motivates you to want to see them more closely. You want to buy a telescope and most anything that will magnify will be good. I mean, if you want to spend a couple of hundred dollars, you get some good telescopes, Mead, Celestron, at some department stores, a couple of thousand dollars, well, then you're talking serious stuff and it will help you see better. Always look for glass lenses, not plastic lenses, but I'll talk about that later. So these are the neat things that are up there that comprise some of our constellations. These are stars that are up there that we always talk about in the constellations. 
uh, Orion in number one, Sirius is in Orion, uh, in Orion, as you can see, it's right next to Orion and it's on the, uh, the small dipper there. Joe, I'm sorry, did, did I miss um, where, where people can get the star charts? Oh yeah, I forgot about answering that. That's okay. <laughs> well, Barnes and Noble Bookstore sometimes sells those. You could go online and almost order them anywhere. Libraries can help you find them. Uh, they probably have samples of them there. I don't know if you do, Emily, or not, but that's where you could find them. We, we but, do not. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> we do not. so if you want to look for star charts, go to a, it, it used to be you could go to a hobby store, Galaxy Hobby, they'll carry them in, in different versions of them. You could go online and almost order any, any version you want. Uh, it used to be you could go to, um, there was another hobby store you closed up, and that's where I bought my first telescope, my 10 incher. Um, but hobby stores carry them, Barnes and Noble bookstores will carry them, and uh, some depart larger department stores carry them. You just have to ask. It's not something that you can easily find, but they're there. But that's where I would go. If all else fails, go to um, any university, go to the Barlow Planetarium. They can easily point you in the right direction there. Um, so that's where you could get those star charts. Uh, I know that this one I found at Barnes and Noble it happened to be big and you got it, but this is already, this is online too. Uh, so yes, if that answers your question, uh, they are available at, at, at some major stores. Here are some more stars that you can view in the sky, different constellations. And uh, as you can see, some of the constellations are mapped out. And I've tried to get the slides that show the ground so that you get some perspective of where these stars are located uh, in relationship to the ground. If I just show you the star charts, it, it's hard to uh, imagine where they are. But Vega, Rigel, Procyon, uh, uh, Akerna, these are major alignment stars that I've used for the uh, telescope. Uh, again, I have found that on a real dark night, if I look up in the sky, I won't see what you see here in this picture. This is kind of greatly magnified, but there is sort of a cloudy uh, layer called a Magellanic cloud. It's part of the Milky Way, and it peers out to the edge of the Milky Way. You can faintly see this on a dark, on a dark night. You'd swear there were clouds up there of stars. But you can faintly see this and realize that the ethereal light, there is a light in the universe that sh seems to shine all the time. And that's another neat thing about viewing stars in a totally dark sky. But look up, you may see just a hint of this kind of a cloud. So that's another feature that's up there. Now let's talk about the Milky Way galaxy. This is the one that we are in. This is where we view most of our stars. Our galaxy is really huge. And where do you think we're located in the galaxy? Point your finger to the screen. And if, they, if your guess is correct, that's where we are. On one of those small arms on Earth in the sun, all in within that yellow circle at the tip of that aerial. So when you look up in the sky and, and you see a cross, we're uh, looking at um, 5,000 light years away. That's, that's about what we see in our universe. Now, Hubble Space Telescope and all the others peer beyond the uh, Milky Way galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, and get into uh, huge formations elsewhere. Now, if you were to turn our galaxy on the side, think of it as a flat potato chip. This is where it is. And as you'll notice, there's a little red dot on the left side there to indicate again, where are we on this wavy flat potato chip? So you don't see this with your naked eye, but this is where we're viewing from. Now our galaxy does have quadrants, delta, gamma, beta, alpha quadrant. You probably heard this referred to in Star Trek movies and what, what quadrant they're at and that type of thing. This is what they're referring to. And as you can see on each of the arms, there's a label. There's something that uh, 
uh, distinguishes what it is and what it's called. And uh, it gives an idea of where certain stars can be found. So we do have a quadrant system for our galaxy if we ever get lost around there. We also have labels for each of the arms and uh, how they, uh, uh, what stars can be in there. So, you know, it seems to me like astronomers, when they find something that has detail, they got to name it. They'll name it with a number or they'll name it with a, some kind of a terminology. So where these names come from, it's ancient. Now, there's another way to really learn about the stars and go to this website. It has something, it has a device posted there. I got them in my hands right here called star cards. And each of these star cards, you can use them in your family, has an explanation on the back as to what that, like for example, Apis, what's Apis? Well, it's a bird of paradise. What does it consist of? That's included on each of the cards. There's an explanation for Andromeda and it has quite a bit written on Andromeda, the princess and the history behind how Andromeda became uh, the head of the Hydra and people would turn to stone if they looked at the Hydra. So there's all of these mythological explanations on these. Antilla, um, I think Aquarius. So you can print these out by going to this website, you download that, you figure out how to set up a pattern on your computer and print them out. At least they show the images on the computer. You can print them out and these are kind of neat. You can play, use these in your family and play games at night or use the cards as reference. So that's what I like about these cards. I laminated mine. I got them ready to go. I keep them in alphabetical order. And it works out really great when I want to explain stars to people. So that, this is a good system also. Now, you've heard of all of the planets. What you don't know sometimes is how they line up. What are the approximate, um, you know, how do they line up? What's their order, so to speak? So obviously Mercury is in closest to the sun. Venus is next. Earth is the third planet. Mars is the fourth planet. How many of you realize that Venus was the second planet and Mars was the fourth planet and Earth is right in between? And uh, because Venus is closer to the sun, it's called Earth's sister planet. We haven't figured out how to really get anything on Venus yet. Mars... We got that down. We're landing rovers. We're landing objects on there, exploring it, because Mars right now seems to have resources that can be converted to use for habitats. Venus has an acidic atmosphere. The last probe that went and landed on Venus, I think, lasted one hour. Took some pictures. All they could see is methane, rain, and clouds, and everything that was there. Very high pressure. Uh, I forget how many hundreds of times the pressure, air pressure on Venus is, but it will crush things. So the things that we put out there had to be specially made to withstand the acid rain and the pressure that's there. And then there's Mars. It's a very thin atmosphere. We actually were able to fly a helicopter this week on 20% less, uh, on 1 20th of the air that is on Earth, Mars has that very thin atmosphere. So you think that they just pack a helicopter in the uh, Perseverance rover. Actually, they had build those blades special so it would generate more current, spin faster to fly than, than you needed on Earth. We got thick air here on Earth. But the intriguing thing about the alignment of these planets is that you could see these at night. They come around at certain times during the year. You look at your planetosphere, You'll see when they come. But notice there's only a very small gap here between Venus and Mars as to where habitable human life exists. Makes you wonder, why not all those other planets? Well, those planets have moons. Uh, and we have dis we've discovered that there are characteristics of those moons that could harbor life. Uh, for example, Europa around Jupiter. Jupiter has 12 moons. You don't see those in this chart. But Europa is a nice covered planet that may have a subterranean ocean. And when you get into that ocean, there may be life there. And they're preparing a probe to go to Jupiter to be able to drill into the surface of uh, Europa. And 
Enceladus and a few others uh, that are around Saturn. Any questions, anyone? Again, I'm trying to make you aware of what's out there. So again, you look at the uh, sky, and as I say, there are certain events that happen during the year that you have to look up. And I think if you do type in Google special events happening in 2021, you'll probably find a few more that I listed here. One of them we know is that this configuration, it already took place at the end of uh, April, mid part of April. You can see Orion the Hunter. Why is it called Orion the Hunter? Well, because right here is the Hunter's Shield. Here we are, see my arrow? That's the Hunter's Shield. Now here are some stars we've talked about, Aldebaran, Rigel, that Betelgeuse and Sirius, the bright star. And way down here is another star called Alpha Centauri, but we can't see it in this configuration. It's not right at this time of the year. But the Orion's Belt is a typical winter constellation. You could go up there and you could look at this tonight, if it's clear, and you'll see that this is uh, in this in the uh, sort of the northwest area. Uh, you, you get your better viewing when you face south, south to uh, northwest. So this is available up there right now. Orion is uh, called the winter constellation. Uh, later on, you'll see an alignment of planets, uh, and you'll see where, according to each month, that the moon passes them. So you could always use the moon as another guide to locate stuff in the sky. So when you get information that planets are going to be visible, ask yourself, where's the moon? And how does the moon line up with the planets, such as Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, etc.? cetera? You, you really can't see Neptune. You really can't see Mercury, except through a telescope. But this is the general orientation. Now, in the sky on May 2021, uh, May 2021, later in May, uh, you will see a meteor storm. And it's called the Aquarian Meteor Storm. And where do you look at that? You find the water jar or Aquarius. And I have that card right here, Aquarius. Looks like that. It's right in there. Gives you an exam explanation of what it is. So when you see Aquarius, and I'm sorry, I don't have the date when this occurs. Uh, it's usually over a period of days that these things occur. But look it up, Aquarian meteor storm or shower. And, uh, it, and, you'll, and watch what happens. You'll see that in one area, it emanates the meteors. The meteors will appear to come out from one of the stars on Aquarius. Now, it's not that precise, actually but it's a general direction to look at because when you see the sky, you're gonna see these streams of meteors coming back about two every hour or so. Um, there was one back in 19, uh, well, let me think. Uh, I think it was in the, in the er, late, it was in the earlier 2000s. Um, it was called the Leonid meteor storm occurs in November, around November 17th. And during those period of years, three in a row, actually, the first year was something, there were fireballs coming down. I mean, I, I stood out in the cornfield, clear sky. I literally saw these fireballs streaming across the sky. It was predicted that year that you were going to see these things. On occasion, you will see fireballs coming out of these meteor storms. They're larger. Um, they're larger pieces of debris. Actually, they're not huge balls. These things are like pebbles that cause these flashes in the sky. And some of them are maybe this big that may cause a fireball. Uh, God forbid if we ever had a big one. And we've had some of that happen over Russia and over California. And in the South, there have been certain uh, meteoroids, they call them, not meteorites. These are meteoroids which were bigger and it takes time for them to burn up when they hit the atmosphere. And sometimes they don't even burn up yet. They actually land on the ground 
and you got a whole series of people going out to find the pieces. In fact, there's a whole television series called uh, Meteorite Hunters on what they do when they, they track these things. So look for this meteor storm. Also one in August. Uh, Joe, I just um, looked, looked it up while you were talking here, the dates for it. So yeah. it's going on now. It started at April 19th and goes till May 28th. But the peak, it says, is just before dawn on May 5th. Okay, so you got time yet. It's still happening. And uh, it's still a current, uh, a current meteorite. Got to have black skies going. I don't think we're going to see it tonight. Thanks for looking that up, Emily. Um, Lyra. It's, a, it's supposed to be a harp. I don't know how they get that out of there, but they named it. But this is where you can find the bright star Vega, Beta, Gamma, Epsilon. Uh, and uh, it just it forms a... Uh, uh, an object that looks like a uh, like a harp, they call it lira, and that brings us to uh, what about finding things that are out there that we can't see with the naked eye? So that brings in telescopes and how do they work? Um, it, it, you'll be motivated to buy one of these when you realize what's out there to see. First of all, be aware that any telescope you buy you're not going to see these objects is what are pictured here. These are nicely enhanced artistic rendering of these. In other words, uh, the Palomar Telescope in California, which is, uh, uh, I forget how many inches across it is, but it's, it's really a big telescope, stares at these for a number of hours and is able to get these colors. This is what you'll get in a store-bought telescope. Jupiter, not too bad. It's big enough that it's brightest. You can see that. Saturn, now this picture you see right here, I have seen Saturn like that in my telescope. And I mean, of all the things that I want to see in the sky, it's amazing every time I see that ball with the rings around it through my telescope. Uh, you can't see that. You barely see it with a binocular but you don't appreciate it uh, unless you've seen it through a, a 10 or a 12 inch telescope. Now, the, the, the clouds in the galaxies are seen like this, very faint uh, and mostly black and white. You won't pick up a lot of color. So your telescope, depending on the, uh, the aperture, that's, a that's an eight inch. A 10 inches larger. The larger the opening, the more light that's left in and the more possible color you could get. Uh, in star parties, I've seen people use what they call our Dobsonian light buckets. It's a huge tube about this. It comes right down to the ground. And these tubes are 12 inches to 36 inches around. And they consist of one mirror in the back, one mirror up here, and an eyepiece. So they actually stand up and they're looking through these Dobsonian light buckets, as they're called. There's our, uh, the, the purpose of the Dobsonian light bucket is to carry a, uh, to gather as much light as you can get. So how do they work? Well, refractors are one of the uh, most common telescopes people think of when they look at telescope. Simply as a lens up front, nine inch lens, for example takes the light from an object, brings it down a tube, crosses it over where the eyepiece tends to invert it upside down. And the power of what you see is in the eyepiece, 10, 11, 12 time power, whatever. The one misnomer that we tend to make is the more powerful the eyepiece, the better we can see something. Not necessarily. You wanna see clarity and sometimes a high power eyepiece, it will not bring you a clear object because it's just not right for that night to view it. You need to have good viewing. So that's a typical refractor. You can buy these in um, retail stores, department stores, and they sell them at all types of um, levels of expense. Unfortunately, 
because the uh, one hobby store closed up and we have one now, you really only can get telescopes by on order. Uh, they don't have them displayed anymore. In Madison, there is a place, and I forget what they call it, they, but even they stopped displaying a lot of telescopes. Uh, and I just thought of this right now. If you they want, have them at like Shields or Cabela's or something like that? Uh, not really. They'll have oh. really good binoculars at Shields, okay. which is like a refractor. I mean, that's all your, you got a prism in here and all that, but really it is a, a series of lenses that bend the light like that. One of the more common telescopes, um, and, that, and that's, that's how the refractor works. It's, it's a better diagram of, uh, the one thing you change out is the eyepiece right there. And there's a focal point. The thing is, it's always upside down. You always have to invert it. Now there's another kind called the reflector telescope. This is like a Dobsonian, but on a smaller scale. And these things are desktop size, et cetera. Um, this is not one of these. This is, these are Schmidt telescopes. This just is strictly has a large mirror at the bottom. The light comes in, goes up to a secondary mirror up on top, and then the eyepiece magnifies it. So you're able to kind of look that way. That's how it works. And the reason why is because it's, um, it's kind of hard to look at the long end of a tube all the time. I, I have some friends that I viewed in their backyards. They have big posts, anchor posts, where they could put a huge refractor on and view this. But this allows you to at least stand up and view it off the side. Um, this is a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. That's what this scope is all about here. Um, and I said to people that I would change my uh, screen here so you could see me. We weren't able to see this. All right, well, stop sharing. Okay, now you can see me a little better. And I'm gonna show you these scopes. This Schmidt Cassegrain, um, again, it's computerized, but it's constructed with a mirror up in the front here. And if you can see the reflection, you can see the back plate mirror. So actually, light comes in through here, it hits that back mirror, reflects to this front mirror, and there's like a tube in the center of that huge back mirror. And that tube directs the light right to this eyepiece, comes to a mirror. It's just a mirror that flips it up and I can view it that way. I can also view it strictly by the end, but again, standing and putting it on a tripod is the key thing that you wanna look there. Again, this telescope is the same thing, but in a much smaller scale, it's only 90, 90 uh, millimeter. But when you look in the center there, you see that there's a back mirror there but because this is a, they call it a Maksutov telescope, there actually is a mirror up in the front here, which reflects the light back down to a hole in the back of this telescope, right over here. And then there's a mirror that reflects it up. Again, this is a good portable scope, 90. They've made these computerized so that they can automatically slew and find objects in the sky. They also make them where I can put a sun filter on it and I can cap it over this and I can view the sun like that and see some of the uh, um, objects in the sky. The other thing I want to point out is there are star books available uh, such as this book and they give you all of the constellations that are in there plus a numerous background about it. Um, this is called uh, this is called the National Audubon Society Field Guide to the Night Sky by Knopf, K-N-O-P-H. I think there is also a uh, Peterson Star Guide, much simpler one. But again, you go to these places to find these star guides, you can find a whole lot of things that are uh, simple to use. Uh, we don't talk much about auroras, but that's what they look like, if you can get that reflection out of there. Very, the shimmering light sky in there. All right, now we'll go back to sharing the screen. Right there, that telescope. 
there, I, I, I was able to change modes, glad of that. Well, I'm supposed to be sure, there we are. Okay, the, this is a diagram of how these telescopes work, where the light goes and everything. And this is a comparison of all three, refractor, reflector, and a Schmidt gas grain. You can see how each one directs light paths differently, gives you an advantage to use that. Um, it's another diagram, basically how it works. And I also didn't mention that there's another kind of telescope that does not deal with visible light. It's called a radio telescope. And that has a big dish with a center focus. The light, the radio waves come into the dish. And if you took geometry, you'll understand that locating the focus of a parabola is how these radar dishes work. I built one of these when I was a kid. And I always claim that I'm the one who invented the satellite dish because I couldn't buy metal and bend it like that. Instead, I figured out that aluminum screening would do the same thing. And I was using this for amateur radio antenna. So I, I got curtain rods that were curved on a central disc. And I figured out with the, the dish that I built where the focal point was. Why? Because I took geometry. The first time I found a practical use for any math course I ever took, and geometry was it. I was in it good for about half a year, I, I understood it. But when you find that parabola, the focal point of where the radio waves come in, and it bounces just like a, it's just like imagine this were light. This is the way a telescope works too. You find the focal point and you put a, a mirror or a lens there and you're able to, to uh, observe it. So that's the radio telescope. Did it again. Share screen, come back, share. Okay, everybody should see that now, I'm assuming. Okay, let's continue along. Um, if you're using a telescope, these are typically the top 10 things you wanna see. And these, these will show up a lot but these you can get detail out of with a 10 to 12 inch telescope and a six inch. Um, these are your, your common objects in the sky. Again, heavensabove.com, this is the, the URL site. They'll show you where these are. And heavensabove.com will show you the iridium flares. Now iridium flares occur when the, the satellite flashes its solar panels and in the night sky, you'll see that, that this picture right here is an actual picture of a, of a flare. I used to use this to my advantage. I'd look up at heavensabove.com what the schedule of iridium flares were. And then I'd bring my girlfriend out on a hill and I'd say, oh, Mary, let there be a flash in the sky that we should be together. And I'd be counting out a flash in a five, four, let there be three, a flash to in the sky and blam, this thing would occur. Uh, unfortunately, it scared the hell out of the girlfriend and they didn't want to contact me anymore because they thought I was the devil. But you used to be able to use these iridium flares on a very, uh, a very uh, uh, scheduled basis that way. You can see them anywhere. They still happen. In fact, Elon Musk is putting up so many of them that he's had to paint the, the uh, solar panels a darker color because it interferes with astronomers. If you're looking at a section of the sky and your iridium flare goes off, boy, that's going to help your, uh, it's not going to help your eyes. See on the lower right-hand panel, that picture, that's a map of what's currently in the sky. Oh, the uh, geometric, the, the geospatial outer ring where uh, GPS satellites inhabit in the inner ring where like the space station all those happen so there's a lot of stuff out there and in fact the crew dragon um mistakenly they alerted crew dragon to something that was coming by but there was something that flew by the uh crew dragon when it separated 
it was a chunk of ice or something. They're still looking into that. So there you have your typical air. This is what you see when you when you look up in the sky and ask, what can we see? So what's there? Well, I, I, I talked to you about all of these things that you could see. Here's a, a few natural views of the sky and what's up there. And if you go to the Heavens Above webpage, you'll see they'll give you, once you enter your uh, coordinates in there, and they record that and keep that. So every time you come there, you'll log in with those coordinates. You see that the International Space Station is there. Astronomical objects are there. It'll tell you about space junk. I've seen space junk uh, in the naked eye. You'd see a bright light going across, just like you do with the ISS on occasion. And you could see it tumbling because it, it flashes when it goes by and it starts to go on and off flashing. You know that that's a piece of space junk that's tumbling out there. So this is a very good resource page for that to alert you to some of the things that are there. Uh, this is an example of the uh, chart for when the International Space Station is going to fly over Appleton. And you see it's a combination mix of daytime versus nighttime viewing. But I'm going to leave this up here for a while. Pick a time when you want to view it, and chances are it'll happen. What more accurately is if you sign into heavensabove.com and you do have your latitude and longitude, it will display to you the times it's actually coming over to from Appleton on this, as well as, uh, like you say, you'll get a chart like this for many of the other satellites that are up there. So that's what's up in the sky. You don't need a spaceship to see it, but we've got all kinds of things up there that you can enjoy seeing with the aid of the planisphere and a few other things. Let me uh, take this out. A quick comment and uh, question, Joe. So um, everyone who is here, if you look in the chat if you there's links we added um to the uh wisconsin dark sky park newport state park um in door county certified by international dark sky association also the dates for the um meteor shower or the shooting stars joe talked about and then also a link to our info soup catalog for um all of the the books that we we have a whole bunch in the collection that are like the um, the book that you showed the the guides showing you what you can um, see and then um, I personally just had a question that occurred to me while you were doing this do you know why um, Pluto would be visible and not Neptune and Uranus since Pluto is farther away and smaller because Pluto, uh, the surface of Pluto is darker than Uranus or Uranus um, and Neptune. Uranus is very icy and is bright, and you see it as a blue planet. Uh, Pluto is so small, small, I think it's about a little bit larger than our moon, and it doesn't have a very bright surface. In fact, they've picked up some bright things that have been there. But uh, that, that's one of the reasons why these things, like Pluto wouldn't show up. Now there's still a debate goes on whether Pluto is a planet or not. And there's lobbyists, they're trying to bring it back in and whatnot. They think there's a 10th planet out there that orbits the sun uh, so broadly. For example, if my, if my fist is the sun and all nine planets are rotating around it, well, this planet 10 or planet X has an orbit like this all the way around the whole solar system. And at certain times, it comes by the solar system, intersects with the planets, but it's huge. And we haven't been able to really pinpoint where that planet X is, in a sense. So uh, be, be on the, know that that's happening. The other thing, too, is I think I explained this before in a previous session. If you're looking at the sun like we do at Earth, you see that door in the back of me? Imagine that there are near Earth objects coming at you from that direction. Can you see it given where the Earth, what you're looking at right now? And that's why every so often 
NASA announces that a planet, a planet, uh, a meteorite has come within 100,000 miles of Earth. Uh, they, they did spot it, they calculated its orbit, it wasn't a problem. But that's why, because these things are coming from the other side of your hand, you can't see them. We are putting satellites in orbit that now can see these things and alert us more carefully as what they are. But it still is a possibility one could sneak in there, come past the sun, and before we realize it, it starts hitting us that way. So th that's a matter of perspective. So anyway, uh, that's the sky, uh, constellations, things that you could see there. If you want more of that, as I say, visit the Barlow Planetarium, visit the, uh, um, uh, the, go to star parties. People have them occasionally, Google up star party. Uh, as soon as this COVID thing is over, I'll have one myself. I've got four telescopes that I could put out. People can view for them, view through them. Uh, I don't use them here. Uh, only certain things like a planet crossing the sun, like the Venus transit, that happens occasionally. So are there any other questions regarding this? No, I think that was a really interesting presentation, Joe. Um, just a reminder, if you can fill out the survey, I, I did leave the link in the chat. And yeah, take advantage of the link that Kathleen put down in the chat. Um, InfoSoup, um, we have several really great resources and books. There is one book by Patrick Moore. Um, he has a great astronomy book. So if you can check that out, I think you'd be very pleased. And I've been to the Barlow Planetarium and it's really awesome. So if you're able to go there and visit safely, I would really recommend that. Is that open still? I think they opened, didn't they? I think they're reopened. And I think it's, you know, with, you know, social distancing. Um, their shows are really great. They have laser shows as well based on music themes. So I think that's really cool. Very affordable, um, but yeah, it's I, I love anything to do with astronomy and star shows, planetariums, and it goes to a great cause, research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I that's where I first got interested in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to say the technology really got me going when I knew I could buy telescopes. Yeah, yeah. and if you're not near uh, the Barlow Planetarium, just visit or Google, you know, your local university, your local city your closest planetarium and you'll probably find one and hopefully it'll be open. Um, so if you can join us for our last session, uh, that'll be on Tuesday, May 25th at 1 p.m. Are there any last questions today for Joe? And this will be recorded. So if you missed anything, anything in particular or missed previous sessions, you can always visit our YouTube um, channel for more sessions. All right, I think that's it. Okay, well, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, I think I had my card up there before. Um, uh, I can't put it up right now. Oh, here we are, share screen. Here. Okay, so that's the information. You can always email me, get information. I can direct you to uh, places to, to uh, get other information. But that's basically who I am what I, and how you can get in touch with me through those. So thank you very much. We'll see you next month. I don't know exactly what the topic's going to be. Maybe there'll be enough information from Perseverance and the helicopter. But right now, the helicopter is just kind of flying around. They're programming it to go forward, backwards, or whatever. So it'll be really exciting to see it go on a mission of its own for a period of time where uh, it will gather data and then beam it back. So it'll be either that or other, other topics that are happening. All right. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Bye, everyone. Take care.